very wrong. It sounds like a porn parody, actually. It sounds like that scene from Ghostbusters. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Screenplay Archaeology Podcast. I'm your host, Kieran Head. And I'm Epic Candle. Joining me for the first time. Because apparently I like pain. Yeah, you. I, I was just sending you random scripts and you went, okay, I can do an episode. Yeah, or more, I was picking the worst scripts possible and you sent them to me and here we are. It was more like he went, send me some video game based scripts. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, I thought they couldn't get any worse than what I've actually seen made into movies, but I was wrong. Um, well, I mean, that's there's a pretty low bar. Some of these aren't quite bottom of the barrel. <laughs> oh, good. So the worst is yet to come. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, some, some of those I already did episodes on. <laughs> Castlevania. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, before we jump into this episode, I want to get my usual plugs out of the way. If you like this show and you want a similar subject matter, check out the Shelved Film Podcast. I got that link down below. Also, check out the uh, the Table Reads Podcast, where they do blind, full read-throughs of unproduced scripts, which can be very fun to listen to. Especially listen to them just squirm at some of the bad ones they've done, so give them a listen. And if you want to contact the show, you can send a message to screenplayarchaeology at outlook.com. That's all one word, all over case. And we got uh, fa- we got social media pages at uh, Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter. And we also got a, uh, a blogger page. And no, I do not have an Instagram yet. I have no clue what the fuck pictures I would post there. But also, I don't know if, I'm, if this is going to be ready yet by the time this episode goes up, but I'm just going to mention it now. I'm going to be restarting the Bonfire t-shirt campaigns to see if anybody uh, bites this time. So the links are, if you want the Hellraiser-inspired shirt, go to bonfire.com slash screenplay dash archaeology dash one. And if you want the uh, the Jurassic Park 4 script-inspired shirt, go to bonfire.com slash screenplay dash archaeology dash Muldoon and you'll get something that's big. If, if you even remember that episode there was a joke we made about the raptors moving a corpse and if you if you remember that you'll get the joke on the shirt if you want it so yeah if those links are even up and working by the time this episode goes up um go ahead and check those out but i just figured i'd cover my bases just in case you're allowed to comment on the merch situation if you want to i mean I'm not sure what to say, actually, because I haven't gone through all your podcasts yet. Oh, that! Oh, I don't blame you for that. We got loads. So I've noticed, yes. Yes, I've been doing this for a few years now, and somehow we're still under the radar. <laughs> 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 it's probably because I am shit at self-promotion, but, but you know, as you do. But yeah, the subject yeah. of uh, today's episode, I'm going to say today instead of tonight, because I always say tonight regardless of what time of day it is for me. <laughs> But it's recovering Clock Tower, written by Eric Poppin, and it's based on the Clock Tower game series. And the basic synopsis of the script, before we go into some brief background stuff, is is that the story... I'm reading this off an old article, but it says, Variety reports that the story centers on a troubled psychiatric patient who's named Alyssa Hale in the script who witnessed her parents die and is constantly plagued by religious imagery. And said imagery includes voices accusing her of shit constantly, although being very vague about it, and a figure in a wide-brimmed black hat and black clothing and and a gigantic pair of shears, and her psychiatrist, Dr. Bates, gets pulled into it as well. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. it, yeah. Now, you know a lot about the games, so I'll let you take the reins on that. All, yeah, so all I really know is that they're like the games where you run away instead of fighting, and they kind of pioneered that in a sense in survival horror. 
Pretty much, yeah. The clock tower series started in 95, and the first one was actually a Japanese-only thing. It got never officially imported into the Western market, and it was heavily inspired by Dario Argento's 1985 phenomena. I've seen that. And Yeah, so basically Jennifer Simpson, which is basically Jennifer Connelly, but, you know, with a different name, um, and a few of her... Fellow orphans get adopted in Norway. I have no idea why this is said in Norway. But they get adopted to a house called Clock Tower because it has a clock tower on it somewhere. Spoilers, and basically, the, the script is not called Clock Tower because of that. Yeah, it's not. But yeah, in the game, basically, people start getting killed. You get haunted and harassed by a small, deformed human thing with giant pair of scissors and you're just supposed to run away and solve the mystery and try to get the best ending. Yes, and that is that is very phenomena because I have seen the pictures of Jennifer and she is basically traced over from an image from phenomena. And the killer in that is a little tiny shrunken person with a uh, long bladed weapon, but it's not shears. Yeah. Uh, so after that, there's the second Clock Tower game, which was published in 96, and this was the first one brought to the Western market. And it's a direct continuation of the first one, uh, set about a year after that, where Jennifer is trying to sort through the trauma she experienced, but turns out that at the end, uh, Scissorman did not die and is trying to kill people again, and there's some exorcism mumbo jumbo thing and you occasionally play as another character and again there are multiple different endings depending on what you do as you do in these kinds of games also none of which appears in this script (laughs) yeah and um uh then there's the uh clock tower ghost head which was the original japanese name and it was published in the Western market as Clock Tower 2, Struggle Within. Which is a better in... title. Yeah, it's a better title. Ghost Head uh, just sounds wrong. Ew. Very wrong. It sounds like a porn parody, actually. It sounds like that scene from Ghostbusters. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was originally published in Japan in 98, I think. And uh, the original version was that it was set in Japan, in Osaka. But... Somewhere down the line, they decided that it should be set in California in the North American release. As you do. And, um, yeah, by the way, this game never got a official European release. It was North America only. So, there's one. Now, here's where we get to the fun part. The protagonist was named Alyssa Hale. Who was in and, my synopsis earlier. Yeah, and she has a split personality and... There are heavy quotes on that split personality thing called Mr. Bait. And <laughs> at least he's not yeah. named Master. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> it is stylized as MR Bait. So, you know, it's kind of up there. And there are no clock towers in this game that I can see, actually. Yeah, it has nothing those, to do with the previous game. It, it, it's it's like a it's one of those artifact titles like Resident Evil, even though you're no longer in a house. Pretty much, yeah. So Until you get the seven. Yeah, yeah, pretty much like that. And there's actually not much to say because there's like curses and zombies and dude in an oni mask wielding a hatchet. And none of that around. is in the script. None of that is in the script. <laughs> All the really interesting sounding stuff is not in here. Yeah. And, um, Are we giving our hand away too early? <laughs> <laughs> no, because there's still so much mess to go through. And then finally we get to Clock Tower 3, which is in fact the fourth game of the series. And uh, this was published in about uh, 02 in Japan and 03 in the Western market. And um, this one's set in London, I believe. And... There's a character in it called the Dark Gentleman who wears a black coat and a black hat with a white brim. So, you know, there's that. And um, this is actually the first game in the series that isn't a point-and-click game. Yeah. So you actually do control the girl who's also called Alyssa, but the surname escapes me right now. Alyssa, I want to say it's Hamilton. 
Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I think it's got to be Hamilton because that's going to come up in a second when I talk about film background. Yeah. Yes, I I checked the Wikipedia page. It is Hamilton. Okay, yeah. So this one's actually very different from the previous one in that the sister man is the sister twins. And no, it doesn't make any sense either. And um, there's a giant clock tower in this one, but it's one of those magical clock tower things that sort of burst forth from the earth at the critical time. As you do. Yeah. And there's a lot more magical occult thing going on, but like it's all the ge- all the games basically have a female protagonist who is fairly young, like teenager, and she's up against forces that she can't directly fight, so she has to run. That's about it. It uh, says, according to Wikipedia, that in Clock Tower Three, she is part of a lineage of female warriors who travel through time. Yeah, the time travel is a thing, but it's like this weird wibbly wobbly timey wimey thing where you're supposed to quantum leap and put right what was once wrong I was, sort of thing. I was literally <laughs> going to make a joke about quantum <laughs> leap because I've seen. I used to watch reruns of that constantly when I was like seven. Yeah, so <laughs> like, I mean, you don't actually make it so that the people who died in the original timeline suddenly come back to life. You just sort of put their ghosts to rest and fight the and that's your source of power. I don't know. It's it's a really weird game. Yeah. Well, I mean they all sound like really weird games. Yeah, but this like weird, weird I mean, okay, Clock Tower Two struggle within that sort of started the weird leap from the usual, but then Clock Tower Three just went whole hog. Oh yeah, I can imagine. So yeah, that covers the games, and as you can imagine, none of that really ends up in the game, aside from shears, black clothing, and a few character names. I mean, in the script, I mean. Yeah, that's about it. But so, I mean, like, do you think yeah, we're, we're pa- up to a good start. do you think we're past due for a clock tower game revival? I mean. It could work because the series has a spiritual successor in the Haunting Ground game, which is an excellent game. And it actually started development as a Clock Tower game continuation, but then the name was dropped from the title and it became the Haunting Ground. Yeah, and weirdly, so, weirdly, some of the mechanics from that also made their way from early builds of Resident Evil 4. Yeah, so it's like a mix and match. I think... Oh, in the right hand, the Clock Tower series could do with a revival, but I can't seem to think of any people I'd trust with the series. I mean, it's not, like, mind-blowingly grand or anything, but, it's, like... Uh, this is... The Amnesia people? Possibly. Maybe. If they can avoid some of their annoying habits. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure they can. Yeah, can we not... But... Can we do a game where we don't have to manually open doors and drawers and cabinets? <laughs> but the immersion, though. <laughs> so I guess that takes us to a uh, film background here, and there's not a hell of a lot. Yeah. Uh, so pretty much a film was first announced in June 2006 with a Chilean director named Jorge, and I'm going to fuck this up, Olguin, Olguin, I took Spanish classes, I shouldn't be fucking that up, but, <laughs> and he directed a number of, I, I checked out his, uh, his Wikipedia page and his IMDb, he directed a number of horror and fantasy based films, one of which, I can't remember the actual name of it, but it was a vampire movie, which was built around goth subculture and LARPing. Which okay. got a whole bunch of attention because apparently Guillermo del Toro saw it and wanted, and he got it localized here. So I might watch that just because that sounds just weird enough to be entertaining, at least. Yep. And it was written by Todd Farmer, who did he's he's done a bunch of things, including Drive Angry, uh, the My Bloody Valentine oh, yeah. remake. Drive Angry was good. I hear good things about My Bloody Valentine. Uh, Jason X, which I didn't like, but a lot of what went wrong with that movie wasn't really his fault from what I've read. They had on-set writers putting in scream-like humor into it. 
Oh, yeah, that's not a recipe for disaster or anything. Which, when people want Scream-like humor put into the movie, they don't want the actual humor that worked in those movies. They want, oh, hey, we're being winky winky and naughty and saying stupid shit about how, uh, this is kind of like a movie. We are so meta. And yeah, that movie's not very good. It doesn't help that it looks like a sci-fi channel show. <laughs> but he, he can write good stuff. The second writer who's listed in all the articles is Jake Wade Wall, whom I've not seen the stuff he's actually made, but I know the name because he was attached to write one of the like 15 different versions of Halloween 9 that was in consideration. And it's the one script of three that hasn't gotten out yet that I haven't been able to find called Halloween the Missing Years, which was supposed to be about Michael Myers' years in the asylum. Sounds absolutely riveting. Yes. I mean, they were just throwing ideas at the wall and seeing what stuck. Which is probably why they hired a writer named Wall. Oh, probably, yeah. And a writer, and the third writer who comes up in all the uh, the articles is David Cogshall, whom I don't know anything about him. But they were set to write the script, and in the pitched story, according to this, Alyssa Hamilton is called by her mother and told not to return home. After investigating, Alyssa uncovers that she possesses a secret power, enabling her to destroy evil servants that live off murdered victims' souls. She learns how to wield a weapon to defeat these evil forces. So that sounds like Clock Tower 3. Yeah, that's basically Clock Tower 3 summed up and probably condensed a bit. And yeah, that would be better than this. Yeah, yeah, it would. I know the script exists and people have it, but it's one of those things it's in the hand of uh, script hoarders, and maybe someday I'll get my hands on it, but who knows at this point. You'll need to do one or two fetch quests to get it. Yeah, I'll have to do an escort quest, probably. Yeah. Honestly, trying to get stuff from script collectors is kind of like doing a fetch quest, because... I got a script recently that people, that they stamped my name across every page because they're so paranoid about getting <laughs> out, even though this movie is never getting made. But that's a tangent for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> and so production was set to begin in December 2006, but nothing happened. And we don't know why. I'm guessing adapting something like Clock Tower 3 that involves time travel and evil spirits and blah, blah, blah. I'm guessing that was too expensive for whoever was funding it. Probably. But a couple of years later, in 2008, it got picked up again by a different studio called Senator Entertainment, I think is what it's called. And they put together a script. They got a script that was written by Eric Poppin, which is this version. And he wrote, I looked up his IMDb, and thankfully this isn't one of those cases where there's like four people with the same name, and I'm not sure which one this is supposed mm -hmm. to be because that happened with my doctor strange episode where there was like there was like four different writers on imdb named jeff welch and i'm like which one which one wrote this crappy script but i looked at his i, I looked at his imdb credit and he only has like four credits one of which is dialogue on some 90s bill paxton movie about aliens okay two of which were Michael Dudikoff action movie, so direct to video action slot schlock, one of which he went uncredited for. And, Absolute quality right there. Yeah, and then there's uh some other some other movie which I forget what it was. So yeah, this is not a very prolific guy. Yeah. It might become self evident why in a few minutes. Yeah, we'll get to that. But among other things, they they cast Britney Snow in the in the lead, who at the time had just started the Prom Night remake. Good sign there. Yeah. And they got a German director named Martin Weiss to direct it, who did The Hills Have Eyes 2, the sequel to the remake, which I never saw. I saw the remake and I liked it, but I heard nothing good about the sequel, so I didn't see it. <laughs> Although it's probably better than the sequel to the original, which was a clip show. Okay, now there's a choice. Which apparently Wes Craven only made that movie because he needed the paycheck or something. And so they they only had so much money, so they made a clip show, but that's irrelevant. And pr okay. production was supposed to begin in November of 2008. And there's an article dated September where it says that Mila Jovovich was cast in a role, but I have no, didn't say who, and I have no clue who based on the script. 
And then production just never happened on this. Now, I'm not going to save what happened for the end of the episode like I usually do, because there is no what happened. It just didn't happen. So, yeah, this version just didn't happen. You know, it hit the, you know, got to the production start date and then didn't happen. And then three years later, another director, David R. Ellis, announced that he was directing the film. Now, you might recognize some of his movies from Deus Deacon's reviews. He directed Final Destination 2. Oh, boy. And The Final Destination. Oh, yikes. <laughs> that is not a very good thing. Which that one was the most angry I think he's been in one of his reviews. <laughs> yeah. Or in the yeah. running. But uh, he also directed Snakes on a Plane, which... It was fun. Which I have fun with because it knows how that that's that's a so stupid it's fun movie that that works because it knows what it's doing. Yeah, it's it it's the kind of movie that makes your popcorn taste a bit better. Yeah, it, and that's about it. It, it. it strikes the balance between dumb and entertaining reasonably yeah. well. I mean, you you're there to watch snakes on a plane kill people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it delivers. Oh yeah, in spades. But then <laughs> nothing was heard for years after that. I mean, to the point where he died before anything on this movie actually happened. Yeah. Is that fate saying, don't make this movie? He was spared from the agony of this, unlike we. Well, who knows if it was even this script still in, in 2011. I hope spring, spring's eternal. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, um, Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> so... We're going to have to jump into the script now. It's dated, it's a second draft with revisions dated May 18th, 2008, and more revisions on June 18th. So this is like a month's worth of revisions on this thing. Yeah, it did so much good. Yeah. You will see it soon. And you can, t and you can tell it's it's been, uh, it's been revised by reading through it, because there's a bunch of things where like little scenes have been omitted. Which were probably just random, like, insert shots and stuff like that, which were taken out during the revision. Yeah, probably something like that. Okay, so, we're just gonna dive right into this thing now, so folks, strap in. Yeah. Uh. And so, it opens with a young woman named Alyssa Hale, game resemblance one of, like, three or four. Yeah. Just a name. She's in what's referred to as a Skid Row hotel room. And I thought when I first started reading this that the Skid Row thing was just describing how seedy this hotel was supposed to be. No, yeah. later on we find out whatever city this is taking place in, this neighborhood is actually called Skid Row. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping that's like an affectionate nickname and not actually literally Skid Row because that would be very unfortunate for the student planning. Yeah, that's like having a neighborhood called Crime Alley. Yeah. And just randomly taking a walk through there after dark. Nothing bad could happen, said Thomas Wayne. But she's in a hotel room, and she's got this cobbled together contraption with mirrors and a medical book on it. And she's basically using it to perform surgery on her lower abdomen, what we don't know yet. And we see, we, yeah. we see her start to make the incision. And then it cuts ahead several months, and she's now confined to the... Queensbury Mental Institution, which they say is somewhere in New England, but they don't say where. Yeah, but I mean New England. Because New England's creepy, I guess. Apparently so. And because it connects to the backstory stuff they do later, I guess. Yeah, uh, I'm not looking forward to those. <laughs> I know you're not. Ugh. And so she has like this almost kind of manic obsession with the Bible. She's constantly reading from it. At reading it and reciting from it, and she visits her doctor, who's named Kaplan, and he asks her if she's still hearing voices, and and you know, and there's this weird bit where he has her like lift up her shirt and he prods her uh, her her surgical scar, and I'm like like a medical professional would yeah, do. I don't know about that. I mean, they do sort of like try around the wound area, but like prod sounds really violent for something like that. But especially, like, months and months after the fact. Yeah. I mean, it just comes off as just a tiny bit creepier than it's supposed to. A little bit, yeah. But, I mean, we're not doctors. What would no, we know? 
I go, I know, I mean, I've only cut parts of myself off a few times in the past. Yeah, it's why I wear experts. <laughs> and she lies about not hearing the voices, which we know because we can hear the voices as well, and they're accusing her of being a liar. And I have to mention, the multitude of voices, not going to make a whole lot of sense, considering there's only about three ghosts in this, <laughs> as we find out. Yeah, so the voices basically just come out of nowhere, do nothing, and then vanish somewhere during the story. And she goes about her day, and she's like sitting in the day room, and there's a patient named Lundy, which just sounds like such a pleasant and he makes he makes lewd gestures and remarks towards her, basically coming on to her. And I'm like, don't they segregate yeah. genders in mental institutions? I think it depends, but like, I mean, what would a script like this be without the unfriendly neighborhood rapist making an appearance? Oh, of course. I mean, that's pretty much standard at now. Because I mean, if I learned anything from Silent Hill Origins, it's that they crazy segregate the, those two groups of patients to the point where you got to solve ridiculous puzzles and unlock every other door in the place just to go from one side to another. I mean, obviously. Yeah, and I, yeah. of course, you know, Silent Hill is a great analog for reality. Yeah. You see, I'm already talking about better video game related stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that pretty much sets the tone for the rest of the script. And so that night, as she returns from the bathroom... Alyssa hears a chorus of female voices berating her and calling her a witch because this guy apparently saw the Silent Hill movie. Yeah. And actually, uh, this takes place in a bathroom where the toilets and sinks and walls start overflowing with blood. And I'm not going to lie, I actually had to stop here and scroll back up to the title page because I was sure you've sent me some sort of a Silent Hill script by accident. Oh, yeah. Because, (laughs) I mean... Alyssa, with voices, in a room that bleeps. I was like, wait, hang on a minute. Well, I'm going to have to be a nitpicky douche here, but in Silent Hill, it's Alessa with an E. Yeah. And there's this whole thing about how they changed, it was, the name was going to be uh, Aja after uh, Argento's daughter, but some somebody, somebody at Konami said that it wouldn't sound like a common name, so they changed it to Alessa, which just sounds... It just sounds weird and off because the vowel's different. Yeah, a little bit. But yeah, you know, random trivia about a completely different video game franchise aside. Yeah. <laughs> but she she hears those voices berating her and is pursued by the figure of a man wearing a wide-brimmed hat and carrying a large pair of shears, which is seen only as a shadow on the wall at this point. So yeah, we got the Scissor Man, kind of. Kind of, sort of, not really. And she she flees down the uh, abnormally long corridor because like it's it's like a weird dreamscape she's in, and she hides in a storage closet where she is strangled by a noose, as the ghost of a woman and child watch. Yes, just a spontaneous ghostly noose. And so nurses later find her there, tangled in IV tubes, but otherwise unharmed. Yep. So ooh, is she crazy? Ooh. And there's an un ominous bell in the background. Mm. Yes. You know, if, if I had sound effects, I'd put the Hellraiser chime in the background. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can all imagine it now. Yes, we can. Those of us <laughs> who have imaginations. Yeah. And so Kaplan and two other doctors from the Institute who get names, but they don't really matter anymore after this scene, so I didn't bother writing them down. Yeah, They're observing her through glass while she's in a padded cell, which, if there's a window looking in, doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of a padded cell? Yeah, I mean, it's a surface you could just, you know, bang your head against and hurt yourself, so that's not a very good design choice. But hey, we're not doctors, what do we know? Yeah, and they're, uh, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a a construction worker, I can't build the cells to spec. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and we get this, and they talked about how despite being on a large amount of sedatives, she remains hyperactive. And we see her point of view, and she views the cell as the inside of a decrepit clock tower. And I will admit, this would actually be kind of a cool visual, like cutting to her perspective and seeing her looking up at the inside of a clock tower. That's one it thing. Re- that's one thing I give this script is that there are the occasional spook moments in this that actually kind of work. 
But I mean, that's a few good things in a giant trash can, so that doesn't save anything. Yeah, what this guy needs to do, right, is we he needs to, like, be the guy who gets brought in to sort of punch up the scare scenes in an otherwise okay horror script. Yeah. That's something he would be good at. There are writers who do that, where they are brought in to punch up the dialogue or punch up the action scenes and stuff like that, so... So it, it's a possibility. I don't know if any studio making a horror movie on this level of budget would be willing to spend that much money on more than one writer. But yeah, but you know it is what it is. Like maybe Blumhouse would spend that kind of money. But <laughs> also, and then we see Kaplan who's perusing a book on severe cases by a Dr. Thomas R. Bates, Mister Bates, ha ha ha, Clock, <laughs> Clock Tower Two. Struggle Within by Metallica reference. <laughs> yeah. And we, we meet him in the midst of a therapy session, bored and ignoring his patient. And I write here in my notes, he's a charming fellow, isn't he? Yeah, a real professional. I'm like, aren't you supposed to be, you know, helping people, not just like ignoring them and trying to duck out of your session early, which he actually tries to do? Yeah, he's a bit of a dick. Not sure why he's the protagonist, but here we are. It reminds me of a Dreamcatcher where Thomas Jane's character is a um, is a therapist and he he and he's also he has like low level psychic powers and stuff like that and he just goads this guy into eating himself to death. Okay, which is such a random plot point because it's not really relevant to anything. Like he just goes like, "Are you trying to eat yourself to death of what happened to your mother?" And then it skips ahead like six months and you go like, "The guy ate himself to death." <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then. Yeah, Dreamcatcher is shit. So I can surmise. Yeah. <laughs> the best thing about it is Morgan Freeman playing a psychotic villain, which is entertaining, to say the least. Once <laughs> again, more interesting things to talk about than this script. Oh, boy. This is not a good start. <laughs> no. It, okay, I'm going to hold back on, when, on what I'm going to say about the script structure until we get to that point, but oh, boy, does this plot have a very slow progression to it. Yeah. But so he drives home, and we see that his house is an under-renovation fixer-upper. And by the way, there are a lot of, like, scene headers put in where he's just, dry, where characters are just going from place to place. And it will show you, like, the turns they make as they go. And, like, that's probably some of what got omitted in this thing whenever you see an omitted scene. I mean, I'm not sure why. It sounds absolutely riveting. Yeah, like, I mean, did we learn from Manos to Hands of Fate that watching people drive is the most interesting thing ever? Yeah. But we, we see that his house is this under-renovation fixer-upper, and he mentions that, like, fixing the house is his therapy. And I'm like, okay. I mean, you do you, dude. <laughs> They're like, it just seems like an excuse for them not to build the whole set. Yeah, I mean, if you have a limited budget, eh. Like, yeah, we can just have, like, a limit, we can just have, like, like unfinished walls in here and we have an explanation written in. It, there's actually a set in Twin Peaks that sounds exactly like that. <laughs> Except the house is nowhere near as big. Okay. Okay, we meet his wife, Sandy, which for some reason is spelled with an I, because quirky. I guess. And his daughter, Chloe, and we learn that Chloe likes to draw and she talks to imaginary friends. Put a pin in the imaginary friends. That's important later. Yep. And we also learn he's not comfortable with introducing his daughter to religion, which we get this whole scene put in where it's like, oh, the the father, what's his face, came by and asked if we're going to induct her into catechism, and it's like, it's like Ugh, I don't want to talk about that. Ugh. Yeah, that's actually a weird running theme. All the Christianity stuff. Yeah, it's weird because. I can't actually tell what the writer actually thinks about it. He's just injecting religious stuff in here. And I'm not, it, it just seems like it's just there because religious horror has been a thing ever since The Exorcist. Yeah, I mean, in the games, there was the dark magic occult vibe thing in a lot of them, but there was no overt references to Christianity that I could spot. So this is weird in the crosses all over the in the Neon Genesis Evang Evangelion ending sort of thing. Yeah. It's uh, just there. Yeah, or um, or Link having a cross on his shield in the original Zeldas for no reason. Yeah. Mothra's symbol being a glowing cross in, in the Toho movies, which that I still don't 
Jesus moth? Uh, <laughs> Jesus moth. Because moth I mean, because yeah. I mean, I technically know. speaking, I mean, moth would. Every Mothra that hatches out of an egg is technically the rebirth of the one from before, so I guess she is Jesus. I guess. <laughs> More interesting than this script. Again. But so the next day, he's playing handball, which I guess to mean squash, with Kaplan at the YMCA. You know, I- I'm surprised he could go to a young men's Christian association considering his issues with religion, but okay. Whatever. And Kaplan asks him an opinion on Alyssa's case just as a personal favor. And this is where we learned that Bates, he worked the psych ward at Queensbury for eight years, longer than most people do, because he actually, you know, he actually wanted to, you know, get hands-on experience with these kind of cases, which is a setup for his backstory, which we get way later. Yeah, and it's not really worth the wait. No, it's really not. Like, I mean, it's an okay character motivation, but it's nothing you couldn't have given us up front. Yeah. It's not worth the mystery. No, it's pretty much the standard operating procedure for these kind of characters. Yeah. And so they both go to Queensbury, and Kaplan informs Bates of Alyssa's history. We find out that her father had a religious obsession, and he eventually turned a shotgun on his family and himself when Alyssa was six, but she survived with just a wound, and she bounced between foster homes until she turned 18, and she ended up on the streets after that. And she was institutionalized after the motel manager found her found her bloody in that room from the beginning after having surgically sterilized herself, which they give you the technical term of tubal ligation, but I didn't check to see if that was an accurate terminology. It is. It's when you get your tubes tied, literally, because there are a few ways you can get your tubes tied or cut, and there are several different variations of it. It sounds like she might have, you know, taken the more complicated route. Yeah, um, I think ligation is probably harder to perform. I mean, disclaimer, I'm not a doctor, so what do I know? Yeah. Right. But uh, I think the ligation is easier to reverse. I mean, easier, relatively easier to reverse than the actual cutting of the tubes. Which, so, when we uh, find out why she did it, that does not make sense. Yeah, so, good job with the research, dude. Yep, although I will say, it does give you, like, a a really dark and nasty vibe. Like, just the whole opening with self-surgery is just, to begin with. And then you find out what it was, and it's like, ooh, that's even freakier. Yeah, yeah, kinda. I just give it credit for going to just a weird place like that. A teeny, teeny, tiny bit of credit, because this script does not hold together really in any other way. Yeah, I mean, if that's, like, the strongest point of the script, and that's in something because it wasn't, you know, that strong to begin with. Well, that's not, there, there's one scene which I think is the strongest scene, and we'll get there eventually. Yeah. And so um, Bates, he uh, looks at her files and sees a drawing of a church with a clock tower attached, as well as some depicting a man in a wide-brimmed hat with a cross around his neck. And you yeah, have we a actually, ho- uh We actually had to look this up because... Churches with a clock tower with an actual clock face on it, I had never seen before, but apparently those are a thing, but mostly in Europe. I mean, so. I think I vaguely remember seeing, like, a church steeple with a tiny clock on it, but it wasn't, like, a legit clock tower. Yeah, that's the problem, because a lot of them are, like, really, really tiny, and for a lot of the visual things to work in a clock tower movie, it would have to be, like, impressively big. And that usually just doesn't happen. Yeah, and the thing is, is that when we find out what the clock tower actually was, it doesn't actually need to be attached to a church for the function it served. Yeah, so the whole Christianity thing really is really superfluous. I mean, you, like, could, you could keep the Christianity thing in there, but just for the purpose this guy used it for, I don't know why I'm being super vague, but I am. I'm, I, I, I'm preserving <laughs> the experience of this story unfolding. Yeah, I mean, and it, it again, did, it's not really worth the wait, but here we go. I mean, it could easily have been attached to a town hall or something. Yeah, and those are much more likely to be found than a church with a clock tower, in America at least. And, I mean, and in 17th century New England, the church would have been able to use the the town hall for their purposes. Yeah, they were probably built pretty close to one another. Yep. So yeah, that's a whole tangent. Yeah. 
I was about to say before you started, like, you have a whole thing about this clock tower on a church thing, don't you? <laughs> I do. I always fixate on these little things that don't actually matter to a lot of people, but I look at it and go, something's terribly, horribly wrong, but, and then I just go off on a tangent. But, but to your credit, it did give me a thought I never had before, so... I mean, yay, something you, came you, out of it. Your observations are not without their value. Heck, I'm the guy who stopped and corrected you about Alyssa versus Alessa, so I can't give you too much crap over the clock tower then. Yeah. But uh, where are we? Okay, so Bates interviews Alyssa, and he breaks the ice with a joke. And from what I remember, it was not a particularly funny joke. Not really something about him classifying Alyssa as a jumbo-sized can of mixed nuts. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that's very much a dad joke. But, yeah. Uh, but he asks, her, really he asks her about her fixation on the Bible and if she believes in God or not, and she evades the questions, basically. And he thinks he says he thinks she reads from it and prays because she believes bad things will happen if she doesn't, which turns out not to be the case, but... And here's the thing, most of Alyssa's dialogue up to this point is just Bible quotes. Nothing but. And I've... And I, I'll give a teeny, teeny, minuscule, microscopic amount of credit. He actually looked up real Bible verses to use in this thing. And I, and I actually had to go look this up because I don't have, I'm like, this sounds kind of authentic, but I just wanted to make sure. And yeah, it was real. So he did some research. Woohoo. Not enough, though. Yeah, true. But so Bates points out to Kaplan that her hallucination started soon after the death of her family, which is at a much younger age than normal. And because he says that usually, usually schizophrenics, their um, their whole thing starts when they're like after they hit puberty, sometime in their teens, or early twenties. It's like on the cusp of adulthood. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm not sure either. Because we're not doctors. What do we know? Yeah, we don't know anything. <laughs> and, and he says, "Take her off the antipsychotics, because you know they're not working. They've never worked." Yeah, which um, I don't think those are a thing you can just cut cold turkey. No, I don't think so either. I think that's kind of dangerous, actually. <laughs> yeah, but again, we're not doctors. No. What do we? As so next, you know, we see him looking over the file at home and during a session with a patient. Once again, great doctor here, guys. Yeah, because he just straight up insults the patient. Like, oh, yeah. Dude. And so he's, he's taking notes and he's speculating that her father may have molested her, maybe inside a clock tower somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And like, of course, it's always molestation. Of course. And Bates tries asking Alyssa, but no, no, wait, 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 I skipped. And he also has a brief flashback to his childhood and we see his mother acting erratically, so that's hinting Put towards Put a pin on his... that, that's gonna come back. Yes, that is. And so Bates, he, he tries asking Alyssa about her father, though, and she tells him he's heading in the wrong direction, and clams up when he asks her why he would kill his family if he loved them as much as she says he did. And so that yeah. night, this is where we get to your favorite scene. Oh, yeah, our unfriendly neighborhood rapist makes a comeback. Are we all glad for it? Yeah, that, so yeah, Alyssa uses the showers, and the guard just disappears, apparently. And Lundy grabs her and drags her off into a storage room for some for some good old rape o'clock, because, once again, Silent Hill reference for no reason. Yeah, and apparently this is the gratuitous nudity scene. I mean, apart from the surgery, but I think that's most quick to a lot of people. This is quick too, but, like, there's no cutting into your stomach happening. Yeah, it's quick, unless, you know, you're into that specific brand of Japanese porn. In which case, dude. <laughs> well, I, well, actually, no, I take that back. It's not set on a train. Yeah, <laughs> but she she but um she fights back, smacking him over the head with a speculum, and I meant to look up what that was, but I didn't. I think speculum. I think those are some kind of spreader, like a I forceps think. or something. Let me just do a quick search. Um, yeah, that's actually a speculum is a medical instrument that you insert into a vagina, and then you sort of spread it in order to get. Uh, biological samples or to oh, do boy. that kind of stuff. So he's getting brained by that. He's get, So the rapist is getting brained by a vaginal device. 
Yeah, so I mean, justice? Well. Uh, that's that's sort of clever, but grown-worthy. Yeah, and the thing is, though, speculums aren't all that heavy. Like, they're kind of light, this because guy, they have this, to be. This guy could be a total wuss. He could be, yeah. That is possible. But then yeah. she, uh, she, she drops it, and then she grabs a rusty pair of scissors before running away. And she's almost at the door when a bony hand falls on her shoulder, and she comes face-to-face with the man in black from her drawings who's wielding a large pair of shears. And she stabs him in the chest repeatedly. Bum, Side bum, of the neck chest. Wait, 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 what was yeah. that? Uh, says that she stabs him in the side of the neck, and he shrieks and falters. Uh, she yells at him to get away from her, and then, you know, the stabbing commences again and again and again, and so on. Yeah, you're you're being more detailed than I am. Yeah. So later, Bates gets called to Queensbury by Kaplan, who shows him... I actually, I can't believe it. I, I must have been tired and not, th- not, not thinking of anything, but... I refer to it as the perforated corpse of Lundy in the storeroom. I mean, I think it describes that um, the neck and torso evidencing multiple stab wounds. Like, she didn't stop at just a dozen. She just kept going. Yep. And so he then takes Bates to his office and shows him a bloody pair of scissors that a nurse found in Alyssa's room, which they haven't told anybody about yet, because why cooperate with the police? Yeah, it's not like that's gonna, you know, help anything. Like, all right, and I was gay, and so, and so, yeah, basically withholding this evidence, strike number one, which is gonna get these people thrown in jail. Oh yeah, totally. Because yeah, this script has a happy ending, which is kind of bullshit, considering the amount of crap they pull in this. Yeah, but we'll get to that in good time. Oh yeah, in good time. What bad time? It's bad time yeah, with this it's, script. It's bad time with this one, yeah. So Bates asks Alyssa about what happened, and she deflects by asking about his family. And he tells her about Chloe, which then leads to her asking about why he became a psychiatrist. And he says it was because of his mother, who heard voices from the radio, the little man in the radio, she called him, that told her to do things. She was committed, and he determined to become a doctor in hopes of helping her, but she committed suicide before he could accomplish any of that. And even then, they would have not allowed him to because I think there's like a some sort of conflict of interest there. Yeah, I don't think you're allowed to treat family members or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, because they're like they're too close to you, so it there's so much thing, so much that could go wrong potentially. It's not safe for the uh, doctor, it's not safe for the patient, so it's just better to not do it. Yeah, that's true, especially if you're a psychiatrist. Yeah. You know, as as you know, as anyone who's seen Clue could know, you're not supposed to sleep with your female patients. Yeah, that's um, that's sort of a breach of ethics and a lot of things. Oh yeah, but to get back away from yeah. that tangent, <laughs> <laughs> but it actually is on topic, kind of, because it's relating to the uh, the events. Yeah, but still, this is like this is tangent the podcast. Oh, yeah, but well, this is nowhere near as tangential as I've gotten in the past. Like, we're actually pretty on track. So far. I mean, there's still a lot of script to go through. Oh, yeah. And we'll go through it like lightning by the end, because that's when the plot actually starts happening. Yeah, it's just the beginning and the middle. Most of the script. Yeah. And so, uh, tsh- where am I? He offers to be Alyssa's doctor, and she hands him a note saying, he can hear us. And then she saves him when this tree branch randomly falls on the bench they were sitting on. Ooh, spooky. Yeah, that's a scare that's really stupid. Yeah. And so Bates meets with Kaplan and talks him into withholding the scissors from the police for a little while longer. And he also shows Kaplan the note, which says that someone else made Alyssa stab Lundy. Yes, he basically blames the death on someone else. Yeah, that's not suspicious at all. Yeah, that's not something someone who's in a mental institution would say. Not at all. No, not at all. And so later Alyssa calls Bates' house and Chloe answers saying he's out shopping and she tells her to pass on the message that her answer is yes before hanging up. I only wrote about that scene because it's important later. (laughs) Yeah. At night, Alyssa is reading in bed 
when she has a vision of Lundy's grotesquely bleeding ghost. Okay, so there's one more ghost than I remembered. Which she seems to will away, like she goes like, go away, go away, and then he does. But then she turns and she comes face to face with the man in black again, who calls her a child of the devil and a murderer from birth. And he goes to decapitate her with his shears, and then cuts to her curled up and shaking in her room. Like she's in the corner, like rocking back and forth like your stereotypical crazy person. Naturally. And that was a decent enough scare, I think. Yeah, it was described okay, but I think the problem here is that Lundy never makes an appearance again after this. Like, he's just there for this one thing and then just vanishes. Yeah, like, people will see ghosts that they have a personal connection to and then they will vanish. Yeah, but I mean, the mother and boy ghosts, they're actually relevant, but like, the voices and these Lundy's ghosts, they just never come back up again. Yep. Yeah, it's not explained terribly well. No, no, not really. And so then we get a scene of Bates hanging a family picture in his house, and he sees one of Alyssa's pictures of the man in black appear to bleed, which is incredibly random, and he just ignores it after that. Yeah, but I mean, this could count as a sort of a... Well, they're laying the base base of what's to come, basically. Yeah, and maybe it's a scare purely for the audience. Maybe. I mean, it's not a very good one, but there it is. That describes the script. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, and then it just cuts to him. He's finishing making a dollhouse for Chloe. And he notices that his scissors are missing from the garage. And he asks Chloe about them, but she says that one of her imaginary friends named Leezer took them. Remember that name? That's important. Yeah. And you'll also note that now all scissors are somehow relevant and important. Yes, Sometimes they're course. actually, like, bolded on the script, like, scissors in big bold letters. Because that's the thing people know about Clock Tower. Yeah. Scissors. It would be pretty funny if Scissor Man was running around with those blunted kid scissors going, shh, shh, shh. Oh, yes, absolutely terrifying. Okay, so we move from that. And so Sandy finds Alyssa's note in Bates' pocket while she's doing the laundry. And asks her husband about her, concerned it's getting too involved because she reminds him of his mother. Because, of course, there's always the Freudian excuse. Yes, of course. I was about to say, you know, Oedipus complex. Yeah, but, like, this is pretty much, like I said, standard operating procedure. The guy who has dedicated his life to helping people with Condition X has a mother, father, sister, something with Condition X. And then there's a patient who is very similar to the relative, and they get a savior complex. Of course. As yeah. you do. And But yeah. the conversation gets interrupted by a call from Kaplan, who tells Bates that Alyssa just confessed to killing Lundy. Yeah, I'm Which, thinking that was probably coerced. This is, uh, and that really doesn't go anywhere either. But it does segue to the dollhouse weirdness with Chloe. Yeah, and Chloe has like this weird supernatural experience with her dollhouse where like a door inside it is like opening up and there's light coming from behind it. But that's all that happens. <laughs> and there's sounds of pigs grunting, whispering, clock ticking away, just sort of general weirdness. Yeah, and I don't think the pigs ever get explained either. No, I don't think they do. They're just they're, like, there to be weird. I don't know. Pigs are scary. Well, Those people who think pigs are scary must be terrified of the babe movies. Absolutely. That'll do, pig. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Bates, he goes to visit Alyssa, who berates him about using his patience to avoid his own trauma, but she passes him a note saying that he made her confess to killing Lundy as some kind of punishment, and she implies via a Bible verse that the punishment is for something that her family or ancestors or whatever did, and so that's the seed for the entire rest of the plot there. Yeah, but it's not I mean, uh, it's not a very good seed. It's not a very good seed, and it's very mixed what they do with it later on, because it seems like it's one thing, but it's kind of another, but then it's kind of not. But we're so far off from anything actually important plot-wise, and we're, what, like 30, 40 pages into this thing now? Yeah, and this is basically 
like a bargain bin version of Corsica. Like I don't. Oh god. It's just. It's just weirdness in a mental hospital with tangential appearances of paranormal things. Maybe, possibly, we don't know just yet. Bargain bin version of Gothica must be pretty bad because Gothica is already bargain bin. I know, dude. I know. So bargain bin it had a tie-in song by Limp Bizkit. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about that. We wish we could. We all wish we could. But uh, yeah. she she asks to see her file. The bait says that's impossible. And then later that night, this is where it gets. This is where we get one of honestly one of the scares I actually like. This is the best scene in the script. Chloe is complaining of a boogeyman under her bed and that she's hearing scratching sounds and Sandy's like, oh, that must be termites, blah, blah, blah. And so Bates goes looking for them in the crawl space and his flashlight goes out and he hears the voice of his dead mother. And then the flashlight comes back on and he's face to face with his mother's ghost. And this is actually, this is a well-written scare scene. It's actually pretty creepy. It is, yeah. This is like, yeah, this is pretty much it. This is the best scene. <laughs> yeah, and she, like, reaches out and attempts to strangle him, but he manages to get out of there before anything can happen. And, it and remi- again with the creepy bell. Yeah, Ooh. and it reminded me of a horror game, but the wrong horror game. <laughs> it reminded me of a bit in Fatal Frame Fatal Frame 3, where you have to use Miku to crawl through a, uh, a crawl space, and there's a ghost who comes after you. All right, yeah, that. Yeah, because that's the game where you have to where you have three different characters who have areas only they can access because apparently only Miku can crawl through this this crawl space and only K the guy can move this tiny chest of drawers. <laughs> apparently. I mean I think um one of the characters in that game, I think her name was Ray. I think Ray is the main uh, character. Yeah, the woman with the blue shirt that we mostly follow. I think she has something similar, but it's in her house when she peeks into the attic and there's like a ghost there. Yeah, there's something like that there, but I don't think you actually get attacked in the house. No, you don't. They're just the ghost appearances start getting more frequent in the house, so it's like it's building up the creepy, but I don't. Yeah, I don't think any ghost attacks you at the house. No, it's just, it's just weirdness and scares. Yeah, like the, the the ghost arm that's just randomly sticking out from under the bed. Once again, we're talking about way different and way better horror related things. Yeah, this is this is not a good vote for the script. No, it's not. And so uh, the next day, he meets with Alyssa again, who has managed to get out of lockdown thanks to her lawyer, because apparently he managed to uh, get her confession thrown out, and the, the scissors didn't matter because there were no fingerprints on them. Ooh, spooky. Boogie. But, I mean, the weird part is that I think Alisa is actually, like, leading some sort of an art hour thing where other patients paint or draw. I don't, I don't get why. Like, she was just in police custody accused of murder that she allegedly confessed to, and now she's running the art hour. Yeah, she's running the like, art therapy for some reason. But ca- isn't that what a doctor or a nurse is supposed to do? I guess. Uh, once again, I'm not a doctor. I don't. I don't work in a mental hospital. I mean, that's a lot of trust to put on a patient who's known for having delusions and hears voices and may or may not have violently killed another patient. Possibly in self-defense. Yeah, but like, I don't. How? Why? Who would do this? Yeah, it's very sudden. Like it, it's just. It's just so they don't have to deal with her being on lockdown for later. I guess. It just, it comes out of nowhere. It's never mentioned again. It's just there. Yeah, it's just, it, the, and the whole thing about confessing is important, but once again, they could have done something like, it could have been handled better is what I'm saying. Yeah, it could have, but they didn't. Yep, and so she writes another note saying that Preacher killed Blondie, and uh, he gives Alyssa her file and evades her question about the bruise marks on his neck. So, okay, the ghost actually did manage to hurt him slightly, which doesn't make sense considering something we do at the very end of this thing. Yeah, but, I mean, a lot of things in the script doesn't make any sense. Because there's, yeah, this whole, there's this whole thing that gets brought up at the last minute where it says that, oh, they can't actually hurt you. But then right after that, they can. And right here, they can. So, well... I don't know. I We'll just assume that the hallucinations made him strangle himself. I don't know. 
<laughs> strangle yourself, that's a new Yeah, like, I don't, there's no other option for it. Why else would there be bruises if the ghosts can't actually hurt them in any way? And if they're just hallucinations, then he must have done it himself, because there's no other way. I just realized something about this script, but I can't say it until we get to that point. Urgh. But uh, later, Bates is perturbed to witness Chloe praying before bed, something she's never done before, and notices that she's drawn her parents in separate spaceships, which for some reason freaks them out. I mean, <laughs> that's the least sinister drawing that is featured in this script, and that freaks them out. Yeah, but I mean, one is launched to the moon and one is launched to the sun. Come on, dude. Okay. Can I go <laughs> along with your bullshit for right now? It's a Simpsons reference. Oh, shit, that's right. I forgot about that episode. Yeah, I think it was one of the Treehouse of Horrors. Yeah, it's because the world is, is going to blow up or whatever, and Bart and Homer get left behind because of an intelligence test, and they sneak onto a rocket, but it turns out it's the one shooting all the useless celebrities into the sun. Yeah. I completely <laughs> forgot about that episode. <laughs> <laughs> And this is why I'm here. Yeah, this is why I, I, I hey, I, I can do Simpsons references, but <laughs> like, is this the same hospital Homer goes to where he meets Michael Jackson? <laughs> it could be. It's weird enough for it. Oh, certainly. Oh, yeah, here I am. Okay, here's the weird. Okay, this part's weird. He goes to visit yeah. Sandy at the antique shop that she runs, and they, 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 they Turn the clothes sign in, he brings her, like, flowers or something. Apparently he was so perturbed by this picture, he went, I have to go please this woman now. And then they <laughs> just fuck on an antique bed, and I'm like, ew, you're supposed to be selling that. Yeah, I'm, I'm also kind of hoping that they actually use the back room and not just the actual selling space where there's probably windows to the outside that are not necessarily covered by anything. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, they didn't draw the they didn't draw the drapes or anything. Yeah. So, um, that happened. Yeah, that just happens. Maybe that's, maybe this is, I'm like, maybe this is the character Mila Jovovich was supposed to play, and she nabbed the sex scene to see if she could get Paul to step in as the director. <laughs> Ding, look at my hot wife. Yeah. And we're back on the time. Oh my god, the script. Yeah, but I mean, it's the tangents are at least all related to something that happens on the page. I've gone off on completely bullshit tangents before in the past. Yeah, so this we have that going for us at least. But then she's like, hey, I'm pregnant. And he's like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only purpose of this sequence is to establish that she's pregnant. Yeah. Which really affects nothing aside from the very last scene. Yeah. Okay, so we get to see Alyssa going through her file, learning that her father heard voices all his life that compelled him to read compulsively from the Bible, and also made him confess to a crime he didn't commit and he was eventually cleared of. And in the article she reads this in credits a friend of her father's named Aaron Eckers. So basically this is just establishing that her crazy father who killed the rest of the family and himself has the same thing she has. Yeah, pretty much. And so Bates, and this this is a weird sequence here, where he drives Chloe to school and she asks him if he's going to hell. And he goes like, hey, what made you say that? She goes like, hey, Leezer told me this. He says, you're going to go to hell because you don't believe in God. And he tells her hell doesn't exist and drops her off at school. Solid parenting this guy is doing. Yeah, absolutely. Like, he's only showing a marginally more interest in this than he does in his patients. That's only because the very thought of religion just makes him go, oh, oh, oh. So he's like the atheist assholes that do not shut up about being atheist. On YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, YouTube is basically a bunch of assholes who won't shut up, all collected into one place. <laughs> Hi! Self-deprecating <laughs> humor! <laughs> yeah. Okay, so his car won't start when he tries to leave, and this whole sequence, what even is this? It's not... <laughs> he calls you know, He calls a tow truck, and like the, oh, the, one. the tow truck oh. driver, you know, like the, he's towing the truck and, you know, he's riding with the guy in the truck and then he tries to make conversation. And the dude gets really hostile with him and the driver turns on the radio, which is set to this loud, fiery sermon, which is held by a preacher with an English accent because English equals evil. Of course. And I didn't bother to write down what the sermon was actually about, but it's the usual Sin, sin, sin. Hellfire, damnation, sin, devil, blah, which blah, Which is blah. the same generic shit which has been this whole script. 
Pretty much, yeah. And then the driver, he like, I mean, Bates tries to change the station, but it keeps coming through to the same thing. And the driver starts ranting and speeds up and gets faster and faster and attacks Bates with a screwdriver before they crash. And then the cops, they, he tells the cops that Bates attacked him for no reason. And then Bates ends up not pressing the charges as it would be his word against the driver. But before that, the uh, truck driver mentions that I'm going to kill you, me and the little man in the radio. Yes, which mm. is calling back to his mother. Yeah. His mother's psychosis. Yeah, and we do solve that later, but it's really not worth the wait. Oh yeah, the connection between the two hallucinations? Yeah, and everything, it's just... Oh. It's very soap opera. Yeah, we'll get to that, but just don't hold your breaths. Yeah. Don't hold your breath in general, that might kill you. Yeah. Do not play the choking game. It never works. No, it doesn't. Silent Hill reference again, because that comes up in Shattered Memories. <laughs> Which is really surreal to see that come up in the game, because they actually held, like, when I was in middle and early high school, they actually held a... They actually would, like, tell us about that and tell us, you know, don't do that. <laughs> because it was a thing at the time, apparently. I think those are the things that come and go every now and then. People always bring that up. Yeah, it's the newest fad. That, drugs, you know, the usual. Yeah. Driving really fast because you think you're Vin Diesel. I mean, if you want to, but why would you? Okay, and so he visits Alyssa again, and she wants to leave Queensbury to meet with Ackers, but Bates doesn't want to hear it, and he tries to make a rational argument about not abandoning his scientific approach, but he starts hear seeing things and hearing accusing voices. And okay, this is starting a trend with this character that I find annoying, because he seems to go hot and cold between being skeptical and not being skeptical about what's going on. But, I mean, why would we have a solid characterization? Fuck, fuck, fuck if I know. <laughs> but, I mean, he seriously will take any opportunity to go, Ah, eh, no, nothing's actually happening. And then just keeps freaking out as if something's happening. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like I, it, I mean, it will, like we get ten pages before the end of this script, and he's still doing this shit. Yeah, and we're a little past the halfway point at this point. Yeah, so it's um, I think this needed a few more revisions. By a few, do you mean like a dozen? A dozen, maybe axe half of the script, rework it, you know, the usual. Maybe burn the whole thing and start from scratch. All that, yeah. Nuke the entire site from orbit. Yeah. Would have been preferable. And so, you know, he tells Alyssa that he heard a preacher on the radio with an accent, and she asks him if it was an English accent, and when he responds in the affirmative, she writes him a note asking him if the preacher's name was Eliezer, to which he visibly freaks out. And I have to mention, this whole writing notes thing, if the ghost can hear you talk, can he not look over your shoulder and read the note? Yeah, but I mean, he's an old ghost, maybe his eyesight's gone, I don't know. Maybe he's illiterate? Maybe he doesn't read modern English very well? I don't know, I mean, if he was a priest or anything, then technically speaking, he should be at least literate, but maybe he's just lazy. <laughs> Possible. If it's not spoken, he doesn't want to hear it, because he doesn't have time to read like a peasant. Yep, and this guy seems like that guy. Yeah. Alright, so Bates he hurries home? and asks Chloe about Leezer, and if his name is actually Eliezer. She responds in the affirmative, and he shows her Alyssa's drawing of the man in black, asking if that's him, and she nods. And he tries to get her to say, what kind of things does Eliezer talk to you about? But she won't say anything. She says, he doesn't want me to. Blah, blah, blah. And he actually starts shaking her. Father of the year, everyone. Yeah, and she, all she says is that, like, he says that he's always been with the family from the beginning. And then he's running yeah. around, he runs up to a room, starts looking through her drawings, and he finds the picture of a cemetery labeled Ela, with a church and clock tower combination at the bottom. Yeah. And, okay, I have to talk about this Ela thing. I thought, like, it was a very... I thought it was actually, like, kind of a deep pull of a biblical reference, because Ela is the name of the valley where David fought Goliath. But it's not that at all. It's just a dumb... Thing which they ripped off from uh, a Howling Three of all things. We'll get to that. It's really Classic. stupid. It, it, it's really really stupid. And there's your uh, there's your church clock tower combination again. 
Yeah, it's still a stupid thing. It's everywhere. <laughs> and he assumes that Alyssa must have told her about it over the phone when she called earlier. Remember the pin I put in that? Yep. And tells her as much when he meets her next, very angry with her. And she's like, well, you're not going to talk to Kaplan or let me go meet with this guy, are you? And he's just like, ah, bitch, and then runs away. He doesn't so, actually you know, he doesn't actually say that, but he might as well. It's implied, so this guy's a very professional shrink. Oh yeah, totally professional. But uh, <sighs> later Alyssa meets with Kaplan trying to convince him she's all better, and she actually gets him to give her a hug, during which she picks his pocket and takes his card key. So she's um got some Assassin's Creed skills going on. Yeah, I'm just I'm kind of hoping that the pockets are really loose or otherwise wide because picking pockets is actually really hard. Oh yeah, it is. So like if a mental patient can do it to a doctor who should know better, by the way, then he kind of he kind of deserves what's coming to him. Yeah, he sh- which is actually nothing going by this script, but oh well. Yeah, but what's about to come, he's kind of, he can't exactly blame anyone but himself. Yeah, he should at least get, you know, Doc the Week's pay or something. <laughs> yeah, something. But, uh, okay, where was I? Yeah, she picks his key card and she manages to sneak her way out of the hospital by just grabbing a white jacket. And a stethoscope. <laughs> and putting her hair up. Because as we all know, women become, like, totally different people when they put their hair up. And put like, glasses completely. on. Yeah. We clock Kent our way out of a mental institution. Yeah, so yeah, officially this place is harder to break out. I mean, the only time I've ever seen someone actually do the stealing a keycard thing and just getting out is in Freddy vs. Jason. But that's Freddy vs. Jason. You don't expect smart from that movie. Yeah, I mean, you'd think they would have beefed up the security a little bit after a patient died, possibly by the hand of another patient. Yeah, I mean, this, you can just walk right out. Apparently. I mean, no, this place has has worse security than the one in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and they managed to take a whole day trip on a goddamn boat. Yeah. (laughs) But she, she finds Aaron Ackers, who's like a musician playing at a bar, And he tells her that her father always did what the preacher's voice told him to, including quitting his music career. And he also tells Alyssa that her whole family heard the voice at one point or another, and all were either driven mad or killed. You think this would have come up in, like, the file of, like, you know, mental mental health history of the patient? You think they'd look for that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's pretty standard that when you come up to a doctor to solve something, they start looking at your closest relatives, like mother, father, and maybe possibly also grandparents. Like, they try to get as much information as possible because sometimes it's usually somewhere in the parent-grandparent section. Yeah, like a family medical history, even just regular like medical doctors will look at that stuff. Yeah, so that kind of should go twice as importantly to a psychiatrist or psychiatric. I don't... Ah, but no, so many terms. Yeah, but no, I guess she just needs to get this information from a magical Negro bluesman. Apparently, I don't... I don't. Why did they go with that? Why? Yeah. I guess they wanted to give, like, I don't know, like a Lou Rawls a cameo or something. I don't know. I don't know. I I mean, just... He's a blue... I mean, he did. I think he's the guy who got... Who, who was a guest star on Baywatch Nights? I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, I know a lot he's of. There. Yeah, but okay, it's... let's move past the blues, man. Yeah, because we're gonna be here for hours if we just get stuck on that. Yeah, and so he tells her about Edmund Cook, who was a writer that was researching the Hale family and said they were one of the oldest in the country. Came over on the Mayflower. Yeah, I don't think that's like a big deal at this point. Because yeah. it's been yeah. so long that somehow people are going to trace their lineage somewhere back to the Mayflower. That and the fact that the Mayflower is not the only boat that brought people over to Massachusetts. No, no it wasn't. But, like, why would we care about the others? Let's just put in the one that people will actually recognize immediately from pop cultural osmosis. Yeah, pretty much. And so Bates gets called at home by Kaplan 
who informs him of Alyssa's breakout. He goes like, oh, this is all my fault. I think this is the last time we see the guy, too. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, Chloe is drawn to the dollhouse again, where she sees something that freaks her out. And so Bates comes back. This is weird the way this is. Yeah, Bates is, like, sleeping downstairs for some reason. He wakes up to see Chloe, who's blue from the cold and covered in lacerations. So cuts, basically. And it's like, I'm not sure how deep these cuts are supposed to be. Not very. Because the Probably kid is... not. Maybe, like, breaks the skin like a paper cut, maybe. Something like that. Yeah, but, because, I mean, it's it, it's described really horrifically, but she's walking around for, like, a good chunk of this script from here on out like she's fine. Yeah, so they couldn't have been that deep. And so and so she tells him that something is in the dollhouse, and they head out there, and he opens up the dollhouse, finding the insides are spattered with blood, and the mother, father, and daughter dolls are dismembered and bloody, and the bloody scissors that disappeared earlier are in there as well. So that's kind of a freaky image, I guess. Yeah. And so um, Chloe screams, waking up Sandy, they tr- they treat Chloe's clo- th- th- I just got tongue tied there. They treat <laughs> Chloe's cuts, and Bates burns the dollhouse along with the dolls, which includes one that represents a laser. Yeah, but I mean, fire cleanses, fire purifies. Yeah, obviously. of course. Yeah, fire purifies, as we hear in every religiously related thing. Unfortunately. And so later, Bates answers the phone in the kitchen, and he only hears like like a garbled him on the other end, and he pulls the phone away, and this whole sequence is just weird. He pulls the phone away. We're like, what, 70 pages in now? Yeah. <laughs> of a of a 112-page script, and we still have learned fuck all about what's going on. Yeah, like I said, it's the beginning and the middle that are the worst parts, and then it just all crashes. Yeah, it just all crashes a big kaboom. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that uh, when he goes to hang up the phone, he realizes that he's been talking into a plastic toy. Yeah, so into a plastic toy. Creepy, I guess. Toy. Yeah, he looks around and he's inside Chloe's dollhouse. Ooh. <laughs> and he keeps, you know, he, he's walking around and you know, the blood spatters and now we, and the dolls are in there, only now they're life-sized and cut to pieces. And he looks out the window, and he sees a blasted landscape and your favorite church and clock tower combination in the distance. I mean, I harp on about the church clock tower thing, but this does have more clock tower in it than one of the clock tower games, so clock it's got 3? that going for it. Uh, no, clock, uh, clock tower 3 did have it, but the um, second one, the struggle within. Oh, it, yeah, that's I don't that's think right. it actually had a clock tower anywhere at all. Yeah, it has a clock tower, but it's just like a little tiny Big Ben statue in the room. Probably something like that, yeah, but not like a really big one, because all you do is romp around a house and then a hospital, then a research facility or something. Of course there's a hospital in the horror game. Yeah, of course. That's where all the zombies are. Yep, and so he... Oh, of course, that's where the zombies are. Yeah. And so he looked, So he goes upstairs, and he finds a room full of pigs... And the mother and son ghosts that Alyssa saw earlier. And then he sees Chloe standing on the windowsill with a noose around her neck. And she falls and he runs to the window to go get her. But he looks out and he only sees the lawn. And then when he looks around, he's back in his his real house again. And he hears noises and he goes to the door, opens it. And he comes face to face with the man in black who speaks in Eliezer's voice. So yes, this man with the shears that we've been seeing is Eliezer, a.k.a. Leezer. He goes to decapitate Bates with his shears, and then Sandy hears him scream, finds him writhing on the floor, rambling about with the man with the shears, and assumes he lost his mind that he was the one who cut up Chloe, and so she packs up, leaves, taking the kid with her. Yeah, I mean, I do give this one a bit of a credit, because that sounds like a rational thing to do. Yeah, it seems Just like it's sure. a, it, it seems like it's a, uh, like a reasonable reaction, because he has been acting very erratically. Yeah, and even if he hadn't, it was obvious that he had a very consuming case, and weird stuff had been happening anyway, so it was probably a good idea to get the kid away from the place anyway. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, get the kid, although of course it turns out that the place isn't the problem. Yeah. Uh. 
<laughs> we'll get to that. Yes, we'll get to that. <laughs> All right, where am I? Bates goes looking for Alyssa, finding her, and like I said earlier, Skid Row is the actual name of this neighborhood. And he tells her about what happened, and they talk in the Skid Row coffee shop, and he asks her why she sterilized herself, and oh boy, here's your favorite trope again. Oh, booty. She says that living on the street, she had been raped twice, and she didn't want to get pregnant and expose another child to whatever this curse thing is. And so Bates also asks her about Ela, showing her the cemetery drawing, and then he realizes that Ela is Hale spelled backwards, which leads into the Hale family cemetery. Now, this whole uh, thing of that, and they show like a camera angle of like the sign showing Ela and then moving around the front where it says Hale, that is almost entirely stolen from Howling 3, where there is this town in the middle of nowhere in Australia called Flo, which is wolf backward. I mean, there's pretty stand up. There's the Redrum in Shining, and then there's, um. Nobog, Troll 2. Yeah, and then there's, um, in actually, it was the GameCube game Eternal Darkness, and the surname of the family is Roybus, which is Savior, spelled backwards. So that's like, names spelled backwards are such a stupid thing, because it's everywhere, somehow, everywhere. Alucard is Dracula spelled backwards. Yeah. It's like, you could have tried, tried a bit harder, but you didn't, and here we are. But the way it's described, like the camera angles and the sign being backwards, that's exactly the same thing that they do in <laughs> Howling 3. Here's the thing, though. Uh, when it said Ella, I didn't think of anything biblical or Christian, possibly because I am a pagan heathen creature <laughs> but the first thing i thought was like Ela, wait isn't that hail backwards i don't know maybe it comes up again and then it came back up like it's not a very good plot thing and they shouldn't give it such gravitas when they finally reveal it like it's a pretty simple thing no you're yeah it, it is really dumb <laughs> it's a good but it's like really dramatic with the camera angles and everything but hey, at and least, then it's just at least like 75 to 80 pages in, we're finally getting plot progression. We're getting somewhere. I mean... We finally had an inciting incident. Yeah, not a very good one, but more than we used to have. Yep, alright. And also, this is something which I shouldn't have to give this script credit for this, but so many writers misspell cemetery. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And this guy got okay. it right. I mean, kudos for him, I guess. I mean, this is just a personal thing. I'm tired of people spelling it E, spelling it A-R-Y at the end. Okay, wait. They keep spelling it like that. Yeah. Okay. Other writers spell, just mess up the airy part of Cemetery. I mean, okay, yeah, in Pet Cemetery, that was pretty much on purpose. Yeah, that's on purpose because it's supposed to be kids who don't know how to spell. Yeah. But I mean, bill check is for the week, I guess. Like Contacts? Yeah, that too. Or Contact actually or actually adapting the game you're supposed to adapt. That's for ultimate weaklings. <laughs> why would you? Yeah, why do something like that successful Mortal Kombat movie? Yeah, why do something that, you know, actually works and hasn't been done to death? Why do that? You could do something completely stupid instead. Yep, yeah, but okay, so they go there and they find the graves of Alyssa's immediate family. Now, they don't seem wealthy enough to have a family cemetery. No, I mean, I don't think those are much of a thing where I live. Like, I know there are family graves or family grave plots, but not like actual family grave cemeteries. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't normally hear about it. I mean, unless you're like the fucking lanes and you just have your graves in the front yard. Yeah, but I mean, they do describe it as an old Derek family cemetery with archways and everything, and their name is on the archway. Like, this is some serious money. And they're all, they've all been buried there, even though the place is overgrown. Like, it, yeah, which is okay. We, we gotta stop with we gotta this. Stop. We gotta, we gotta keep moving. We're, we're close to the end here. Yeah. Relatively this, speaking. This so much stupid. There's so little time and so much stupid. Yes, yeah, so little time. And so she, she, then they find ancestors dating back as far as the 17th century, including Asa Charles Hale with the prayer that Alyssa, uh, Alyssa, well, I'm, I made that mistake, shit. <laughs> that she, that's the one that she's always reciting. Vindication. 
the one that she's always reciting as an epitaph. And then Bates makes a discovery of his own. Oh, yeah. Your favorite uh, part. <laughs> yeah, this is where the really stupid shit begins, because he finds a headstone by the name of Elizabeth Montague, or Montague, however it's you Montague. pronounce that. Yeah, and then there's a Francis Montague, and it turns out Thomas's mother's maiden name would be Montague. Bah, bah, bah. And then they go back to his house, and he pulls out family genealogy books, and he finds that his great Great, his great grandfather married an Elizabeth Hale, and then Elizabeth's yeah, but, like, "Your family's got a history of mental illness, dude. I think we're related." Yeah, but his the weird thing is, it's um his great grandfather married her great grandmother. So is this like a thing? Like, did she have a previous husband that died? What are we looking at here? Yeah, it's not very clearly described. Yeah, that's like weird. But okay, let's move on. Okay, yeah, and so they decide to visit Edmund Cook to gather more information, and they go to his house. It's dilapidated. The lawn is overgrown with weeds. And they ring the doorbell, knock on the door, nobody comes, and so they say, hey, the door's open, let's just walk into somebody's house. Who like you do. Who the fuck <laughs> does that? Dickhead. <laughs> that guy from Psycho? I mean, other than that. Yeah, it's like, ooh, bad move, guys. And so they go in the basement, and they find a room full of pinned-up articles and such on the Hale family, basically a big room full of crazy. Pretty much, yeah. And they find an antique pair of shears, and then Cook's wife, Rebecca, um, Jessica, I saw those called her Rebecca for some reason, comes down the <laughs> stairs and is like, what the fuck are you doing here? Which, I mean, that's fair. She's that's so something that people should ask in this situation. Yeah, and she is surprisingly okay with them. Yeah, I mean, she stopped giving a fuck, basically. Yeah, she, she stopped giving a fuck when it wasn't her turn to give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. If anyone out there gets that reference, kudos. But she tells him about how Edmund was obsessed with the Hales, and he told her about Reverend Eliezer Barrows, so you get a last name finally. A preacher from yeah. a town called Hamilton Falls, so Clock Tower 3 reference. Yeah, and that's, um, Barrows is actually the name of the family that was the evil dark magic family in Clock Tower, the first Clock Tower, and then the other first Clock Tower. Like, they were the Barrows family. Ah, so that's another thing that they carried over. So technically yeah, but... calling Scissor Man Barrows is semi-accurate? Semi, but I mean, for it to actually count, they'd have to refer to him as a Scissor Man. So, no cookie for them. Nope, no cookie. Not even a crappy burned cookie. No, not even that. No, no Scooby Snacks. <laughs> and, okay, he was a preacher from Hamilton Falls, and he got rich off the New England witch hunts, killing many, including Asa Hale and his wife, and disappeared after his church was burned to the ground. But Jessica checked the historical records, not finding barrows anywhere, and Asa Hale died of natural causes, according to the records. And then she can. She continues, and she says that Edmund and their son William disappeared. Eventually, they were found in a barn, and he was sitting next, and he was kneeling next to the son who was, had all his hair sheared off and was dead with a broken neck. And he got committed to a mental institution. And he later committed suicide, leaving a note blaming it on the sins of Samuel Hale, Asa's son. And she gives them the trunk full of Hale documents, going, "Fuck it, I was gonna throw the stuff out anyways before they leave." I mean, yeah, that's... Well, it was easier for her to give it to them, because otherwise she basically had to pay someone to come and get it. Yeah. And this raises a question. So what we've been establishing and building up so far is that this is a curse within the bloodline. Yep. Why suddenly would it go after Edmund and William when they had nothing to do with it, other than the fact that he was... So I guess they're the exception to the rule is if someone gets really interested and finds out what happened. I don't know, it gets driven crazy by association. I mean, somewhere in the script they remark about Folia de, which would be the madness shared by two, which is an actual psychological condition that has happened. But, I mean, I don't think it counts in this, unless the guy was, like, a member of a branch family or a very distant relation, then I don't think this just doesn't work. He shouldn't be hallucinating about the guy. 
Yeah, because the guy is specifically targeting this family. Yeah. So, uh, so basically the answer is, fuck it, nobody knows. Yeah, it's fucking we're almost at the end. Yeah, we're almost at the end. And they go back to Bates' house, and they take the trunk back, they put it in the attic, and true to form, Bates is like, oh yeah, Barrow's just a delusion, that was it. Hale scapegoated him for their history of mental issues because this guy stops believing at the drop of a fucking... Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen more stability in a literal wind wane. Ooh. A wind wane on the dollhouse that keeps spinning whenever anything ominous happens. Oh yeah, the weather vane. Yeah. We know what you're talking about, it, it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, because it keeps happening in the script. Every every time when the dollhouse was still a thing, every time something creepy happened, the vein started spinning out of control. So it's like, Ugh. I forgot to mention that because it's completely insignificant. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it makes for a visual thing, but it does nothing for the script. Nope, not at all. And so, yeah, and but he agrees to keep sheltering Alyssa because we're family. We you know, we're borrowing you know plot points from Fast and the Furious now. Yeah. Although technically, I mean, not- technically, this was written before they started doing the family thing in every movie. But yeah, but still, I mean, that's a bit of a jump. And uh, yeah, she's still an escape mental patient, so you are going to jail when this gets found out. Oh, he's super going to jail. And meanwhile, Sandy and Chloe are in a store, and this this is more comical than it is scary. Like they're looking for stuff to like treat her cuts with. And then Eliezer Barrows appears before Chloe and he goes, he like draws her away and then says, you know, tell your mother that you see your father. <laughs> and then she and the mother walks over to her and goes, what's going on? I was like, hey, I saw daddy over there. And she sees a random person walking away and starts freaking out, thinking that the husband she thinks is crazy is after them. And then while she's looking away, Eliezer just goes, snatch and takes the kid away. Yeah, it's like. Okay, that happened. How? It's, why? We don't know. It's the hey, look over there approach. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and so basically, then, he's setting up baits to. Uh, he's trying to set them up, basically. Pretty much, yeah. And, and then Sandy gets all worried and starts looking, and cops are called, and we'll get to, we'll get back to that. We'll put a pin in it for like two paragraphs down. Yeah. So Alyssa's looking through the chest in the attic and finds an old journal with a rusty lock on it. She breaks the lock with the shears, and it says it's the journalist Samuel Hale, the important guy we were talking about earlier. And so she begins reading, and she, like, freaks out over something. But, and then, you know, he gets, there's a base, he gets the call about Chloe's disappearance and heads to that store, where he insists the detectives on the scene that he was at home the whole time, but when they ask him if he has anyone who can verify it, he almost says something about Alyssa, but then clams up so they think he's hiding something, and are even more suspicious of him. Because, of course. And then it gets even worse because they find Chloe's sheared off hair in the bathroom sink in the store. And the bloody shears, the bloody scissors from his garage are there. As well as a Bible verse, you know, that's been uh, written in blood on the mirror saying, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, which is a real one. And it actually cites the book and the verse number, which I thought was funny. Yeah, that's like, okay, dude. He's like, I cited my sources, give me an A on this creepy serial killer scene. Yeah, or maybe he was worried that people wouldn't, like, believe him that this is a Bible verse. He'd have to, like, look it up, dude. Yeah, Barrows, Barrows is trying to show off his credentials. Of course. Also, and then it goes this really funny part where he just, he just books it and runs when they, when they try to arrest him. And then hides behind, he, like, opens up the, uh, the back door, sets off the, uh, the alarm. And then hides behind some boxes to get them to run out the door, and then runs the other way. That's some Three Stooges shit right there. That is, yeah, that's... uh, I can't believe it worked, but, I mean, I don't know. Script makes it work. But he loses them and drives off, and he calls Alyssa, telling her to meet him on the corner near his house. And so they drive away, and Alyssa tells him about the journal which says that Samuel Hale killed Barrows and removed all trace of his existence. And they showed, uh, and there's like a brief flashback when she was reading it earlier where he's looking up and he sees his parents hanged inside the clock tower. So, teeny, teeny, tiny, microscopic bit of credit again. They did not put witch burnings in New England where they never happened. I mean, yeah, that's a very tiny thing. But 
that was a European thing, not an American thing. Yeah, no, Europe was pretty trigger happy with the fire. And she also notices the similarities between Chloe's disappearance and what happened to Edmund and William Cook and suggests that they check out the barn in Hamilton Falls where he was found. Also, they, they erased all traces of Barrows' existence, which is why no one knows about him. But so she theorizes that he went to the barn to save his son, not to kill him. Now, how they know exactly which barn to look at in a New England town, which is probably full of barns, is never explained. I don't know, maybe it had like a neon sign on top of it, saying crazy ghost over here. I don't know. <laughs> Possible. Uh, so I have to mention the whole witch hunting thing. Is it kind of giving you flashbacks to the Silent Hill movie? Uh, a little, maybe. It, but, I mean, it's an easy plot device. Yeah, and, and what's so weird about the witch hunting in that movie is that if you glance sideways at some of the, like, teeny tiny bits of lore in the games, you could insert that stuff in there. Because there's me there's mention of, like, the cult being persecuted by Christians, there's mention of a coal mine and stuff like that. But here it's just made up from whole cloth. Yeah. But, I mean, they had to come up with something, and I guess the witch hunts were the easiest thing. I mean, otherwise they'd have to film in Norway, I guess. Yeah. I mean, even Thor Ragnarok didn't do that. They CG'd that shit. <laughs> and so they reach the barn, and they find no signs of Chloe, and Bates is once again giving the fuck up, thinking that he did something to the daughter. But then, I mean, the... dude, kind of, uh, he gives up a lot. Yeah, he's not a very strong protagonist. No, no, it's not. And then, so, and I do have a rant about that, but we'll get to that. Oh, uh, we'll get to that. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what part you mean, but uh, yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but no, but then he gets turned around at the last minute when Alyssa finds Chloe's red hair clip in the barn, and then they begin searching more thoroughly. Which apparently, I mean, how big can this barn be? I don't know. I've seen some really big barns, but even then, you. I don't think that really all that big because if you stand and into the other, like visual contact with the other guy, probably you have normal eyesight. Yeah. But uh, so uh, moving on, we have um, they're, search they're, they're searching the barn more thoroughly, and then. Alyssa, like, crawls into this other area, and she has a vision of all of Barrows' dead victims, which is all rather creepy, but kind of irrelevant. And then Bates is up in the hayloft, and hears Chloe's voice, and then instead comes face-to-face -face with Barrows, so Barrows was speaking in a little kid's voice. Yeah, which was probably, you know, kind of funny. Might have been. Yeah, might but, have been. I mean, this is basically the event where shit hits the fan. Yep. And he, he, they like they have a bit of a, a scuffle, and then Barrows, for reasons I'm not really sure why, he like detaches the two halves of the shears, and he starts fight like dual wielding them. I mean, that's how the sister twins worked in three. Like oh. one had one of the sister, and the other had the other, and they could combine them into one sister that both sort of wielded, but usually they just use them as swords. That's about it. So they're like the Voltron of Scissor Men. Yeah, but they're stupid and annoying, and I can later on show you what they sound like, and you will think so too. Oh boy, maybe that will be my uh, my sound clip for the beginning of the episode. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, he impales, like, like, one of Bates' legs with one half of the shears, despite, despite Alyssa's insistence that he can't hurt them, and then, and Barrows is like, Oh, in your world, I can't do anything, but in my world, I can do anything. And it's like, whatever the fuck that means. I mean, he phrases it really weirdly. He, he says, in your world, I am an illusion. In my world, the only illusion is you. Wouldn't that mean that they're not actually in his world and he couldn't hurt them because they're not in his world? Yes, that's exactly what that would mean. Yeah, so this is like weapons grade stupid on top of the rest of the stupid. Yep. And it's it's just it's just an inconsistency that doesn't need to be there. Yeah, but fuck it. We're almost at the end. Yeah, we're almost at the end. We're almost done. I never have <laughs> to read this thing again. <laughs> and so he throws her off the loft and onto the barn floor so she's dead before focusing on Bates again. Yeah. And this and he also tells her that 
he also tells her that you know none have come closer to finding the truth but you but you're you haven't gotten quite gotten there yet and so she falls to the floor and she gets up and she's inside a church the church and it's described as a lutheran church but i'm not entirely sure that the lutherans were a thing in new england yeah i actually had to look that up because i mean i was baptized evangelic lutheran because that's like the biggest religion around my parts. Ah. Uh, but uh, there are small pockets of Lutheran faith in America, but it's very much a minority religion in terms of, you know, Christianity. So there may have been something in New England, but the problem was that it wasn't considered like proper Christianity, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, you could go almost anywhere in America nowadays you can find Lutherans, Methodists, whatever. But I'm just not sure that fits the 1695 era that they're going for here. No, I don't think it does. Like, I think it was a thing at the time, but it was very, fairly new and fairly unknown. So for it to have an actual church in New England at that time seems like a bit of a stretch. Much less one of an expensive clock tower. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. Okay, so they're in the church, and she witnesses Samuel Hale drag Barrows into the clock tower, where he tortures him and forces him to watch as his wife and son, who are the mother and child ghosts from earlier, are hanged from the clock tower. Now, this is uh, intercut with Bates being strapped onto the uh, torture table and being made to confess while Chloe has a noose around her neck up in the tower and um, is about to be hanged. And, okay, so this is where it tries to randomly engender sympathy with you in the uh, in the Scissor Man here by saying, oh, his wife and kid were killed, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's horrible, but he was still a pretty big piece of shit and he's been cursing the entire bloodline ever since. So it doesn't yeah, work. Like, he was a shit beforehand. Who knows what he did to his family? Like, I don't know, maybe he beat them up. I don't know. But he was a shit before he was a shit during and he's been a shit since so it's like why what are they trying to do here and so okay here's that thing that he he reminds me of two other movies actually he reminds me of the crazy reverend ghost from the amityville remake okay and because this is a guy who was burned alive inside this place of work and is getting revenge on the descendants of the people who did it to him through visions he's like a shit freddy krueger Okay. He even has a special bladed weapon. He is a shit Freddy Krueger. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what he is. But okay, so okay, so Bates is uh, being tortured on the table, and Alyssa's like, no, don't do it. But Barrows is like, is like bitch slaps her away when she tries to stop him. And, like, he he yeah. like, cuts off parts of, a part of Bates' ear, and then he makes him confess to treating a spiritual condition like a psychological one, and then he just randomly disappears. And Alyssa is able to grab the key off the wall and free Bates, but because he's too badly wounded from getting his leg impaled to help, she goes to get Chloe, but is confronted by Barrows up there, and so they fight for a bit. She rips the minute hand off the uh, off the clock and kind of starts... Wouldn't that be on the outside of the clock? Uh, yeah, usually it, the clocks are constructed in a way that the minute and hour hand are on the outside. That's why the big clock faces have, like small doors that you can open to clean or otherwise maintain. I thought so. And so she's like sword fighting with him and eventually she gets her jacket gets caught in the uh, in the gears and she go and so he's just basically like oh hey I'll just go leave you here to get your head crushed. You know like a normal person? Yep. And there's this whole scene where he said where she tries to get him to uh to let go saying what happened was bad what happened to you was awful but but she's just a kid and he said and she says blah blah he, he says something about god's work she says god is merciful and then we get an almost interesting moment but because we're so close to the end and this is never really explained he says if god was so merciful why do i keep on going and keep on existing like this clock that keeps on running so it's almost like this clock tower is like a weird pocket dimension of time or something or that his spirit is bound to some infernal demonic genius loci that controls the clock tower and as long as the clock tower is a thing he's gonna be a thing something like that but it's almost like it's implied that he's only doing this because he doesn't know what else to do which is 
bit of a cop out. Yeah, it, it's weird because like I mean, it's like it's trying to explain this guy in greater detail, but it's just so random and goes nowhere because we're practically at the end. Yeah, it does nothing. It's useless. Yeah, I, I, w- I wish that was explored more because that would make this more inter- a more interesting story. It would have, yeah. Like, I want to know more about the metaphysics of this weird-ass clock tower. <laughs> Speaking of fixating on the weird part. Oh, boy. <laughs> and so, I, I have no idea how the physics here works, but Barrows leaves her alone, just, let, just leaving her to be crushed, even though she can easily get out of that by slipping out of her jacket, but whatever. Yeah. But it's cold in this clock tower. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so Barrows pulls the lever, dropping Chloe. Well, Alyssa stops her falls by jamming the clock's gears. I'm not sure how this is working. Because it freezes the time. Really? Somehow. Is that it? Yeah, I mean, that's been implied that uh, she jams the hour and into the gears, and the gears grind to a halt, at which point um, time freezes, in a way. Like, Chloe stops dropping, Elisa oh. freezes in place, like it's... The clock tower somehow controls the flow of time within the clock tower. I thought I thought it was saying that the rope was somehow attached to the gears. No, and she I, just and I was time thinking stops. if the rope stopped her part way down, she would still get her neck snap. Yeah, I mean that's part of the urgency of the scene. Like time stops, but oh. uh, it doesn't. It the gears sort of start moving again a bit while later. So Chloe drops again, but then they stop the gears again and. That sort of thing, the big woo. Thank God you were here for this because I completely <laughs> missed that. <laughs> I was very tired when I finished the script off last night, so I was like, I, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> this is why I'm here. You're, you're here to make up for my dumbness. <laughs> but she okay. pushes Barrows off the edge and throws Bates the key, telling him to shackle Barrows in place. And they manage to keep Chloe from falling just long enough, and this drags out for an obscene length of time until they get him shackled into the uh, into the, onto the torture table. And as yeah, Alyssa that, actually has to go back and get the little hand to you know jam the gears again because the hour hand. Because we got we gotta keep dragging out the suspense here. Yeah, we gotta. And then they get him shackled. She falls, and they end up back in the barn, and they're fine. So what kind of shitty fucking ghost is stopped by chains? I have no idea, but apparently this one. And it feels like really anticlimactic, like there's no way that would stop him. Yeah, and I mean, it doesn't actually remove him from existence. He's like there, so there's a potential that he might get free later on, in which case the cycle repeats itself. Yeah, but it's, it's like, like this is. I mean, it is a climax. I just don't think it's the right climax for this one. It's like, it, it, it's just to me. It's just like yo, know, he he wanted a centuries long revenge spree of spreading madness and death among this family. Shackles on a table, stop him. Yeah, it's like this wasn't worth it. This wasn't worth it. No, it was not. And then you know they're all you know have this. Nice happy ending, and Chloe's like, "Are you Alyssa?" And she's like, "Yeah, I am." And then she stabs the little bitch because she's crazy. No, that doesn't happen. <laughs> no, but it did happen in uh, Clock Tower Two: Struggle Within. It did. Kinda, yeah, because um, uh, Alyssa in the game is visiting a family, I think, and they have a little daughter. I think she was like six, seven ish, something like that. Well, the little daughter is possessed by something evil. So at one point in the game, Alyssa's split personality takes over and grabs the knife the little girl has and straight up stabs her in the chest. Like, this is how you handle this. Okay, I was joking, but apparently that (laughs) was relevant. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't stick. The girl gets up and I think she is hospitalized eventually, but like, it doesn't stick, so there's no harm, no foul. As you do? Yeah. Your assault like, doesn't have consequences, I guess. Yeah, because the thing is, like, Alyssa can't fight, but Bates can, in a way. So, like, all Alyssa could do was push the girl back a bit, and Bates was like, well, fuck this shit, and straight up stabs a bitch. <laughs> but, okay. Um, <laughs> so, we get back, so we get a final scene where they're in the graveyard, and Alyssa and Chloe are playing tag in the graveyard. We see that there are fresh flowers placed on her father's and her immediate family's graves. 
because playing tag in a graveyard is such a respectful use of the area. Yeah, I mean, I know my mother used to bring me and my brother into this nearby graveyard when we were toddlers because it was a calm place for us to have an afternoon nap or something, but it's not like we oh, were allowed to run amok the graves. That is that is the, the good hook for a horror script right there. Yeah, actually, the graveyard was literally across the road from where we lived. Okay, that, you learn new <laughs> stuff every day. Yeah. That's a good hook for a horror movie. You took toddlers into the graveyard and something. Yeah. But then we see that, it, you know, that Bates has been reunited with his pregnant wife, Sandy, who has, and it's, she's like six months pregnant at this point, so some time has passed. She's okay with him. Alyssa is apparently fine and dandy, despite breaking out. He's fine and dandy, despite sheltering her and all the other shit that's been going on. Yeah. And everybody's fine. And she looks at the skeleton key, which is around her neck, and that's where it ends. Now, there is a couple of omitted scenes right on the final page right after that. So I'm guessing there was, like, a sequel hook. Like, maybe Barrow's going, give me out these damn shackles, or something like that. Or something like that, yeah, probably. But that they cut out, figuring, eh, we don't need a sequel hook. So that was Clock Tower. Boy, was it not worth the effort. (laughs) Yeah, like, the only reason this episode is as long as it is is because there's so many little things that happen in this that you got to talk about. Yeah, and actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to give my rant about the protagonist right now. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, the Clock Tower series follows certain principles. Like, you know, this is sort of like the uh, there's always a man, a lighthouse, and a city sort of way. Like, there's some things that need to be in the script from the game so it counts as a movie of the game. And in this case, the protagonist is clearly a grown-ass adult man, while in the games the protagonist is a young girl who, I mean, there's another kind of worms here, but basically a vulnerable young child trying to battle forces she can't hope to, you know, win against. Yes, and the other the other protagonist is a grown ass woman, basically. Yeah, so these are capable adults who have the tools and knowledge and know how to battle against something evil. But with children, it's like there's an extra layer of vulnerability and uh, horror because these are people that shouldn't be in the situation, but they are, and they're powerless to you know get out of the situation. The old-fashioned fighting way. Mm-hmm. Which is the so, whole game. You can't fight. Yeah, that's the whole point of the games. They are survival horror games where you can't fight, well, in to it can sort of fire a gun and fight. But, you know, as a whole, you're not supposed to be able to fight in any way, and that's the point. Yeah. And unlike a lot of other survival horror games where they tell you not to fight, but usually end up with a shitload of ammo by the end. Yeah, and here you don't get ammo. You In 3, you maybe get some holy water that temporarily stuns the enemy, and that's it. That's Your way of fighting is to run around and hide in a closet. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, I keep saying that this movie is like, the script is in the right neighborhood, sort of, but they keep missing the right house. Like, they keep going past it and around it, but not at the right house. Yeah, that that's a good analogy for it. And then at the end, they just sort of crashed through the wall <laughs> into the house. But, like, it just, it kind of does and doesn't miss point, I think. Yeah, it, it, it's not very... It, and even when I first read this, and I did, because I've read this once before... And I didn't know anything about the games. I was kind of reading going like, yeah, I'm calling bullshit about this Barrows thing. Yeah, so it's... This wasn't... I mean, it's a horror movie script with the name Clock Tower slapped on it. But it's not necessarily a Clock Tower movie. And a couple of other things thrown in there that are vaguely Clock Tower-ish. Yeah, vaguely. So yeah, I guess that sums that up. Yeah, um... I'm not sad to know that this one didn't make the cut, and it wasn't actually made into a movie. I don't think you've been sad about a single one of the scripts you've read not being made. I have not. (laughs) 
<laughs> but yeah, I mean, th- oh, go ahead. I mean, for the most part, I kind of have this temptation of printing some of the scripts out in full on paper just so I can light them on fire. <laughs> is this one of the ones you wanted to light on fire? Yeah, I think deletion is apropos for this one, but like, there are scripts that I could go on a multi-hour rant about that I just want to light on actual physical fire so that I may finally be rid of them. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I know which I I can I can think of a specific example right now too. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think that that wraps it up. Um as I said before, check us out on Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and on Blogger and you know, you know, shoot an email to that email address I mentioned earlier if you want to hear if you want to hear something specifically from me and um and I guess you know until next time, you know, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>